Uh, good morning. Uh, it's with great pleasure that uh, I welcome on behalf of the leadership of the Hudson uh, Institute, uh, the Right Honorable Tom Tugendhat, uh, who is Minister of State for Security and Borders. Uh, thank you, Minister, for joining us here today. Uh, Tom joins us at a crucial moment <clears throat> in time as we approach the one-year mark of Russia's further invasion of Ukraine. And President Zelensky's historic visit uh, just a few days ago to the United Kingdom seeking additional aid and specifically fighter aircraft. So I'm sure much of our conversation today will cover Russia and specifically what more can be done together to hold Putin, his regime insiders, and his oligarchs to account. I have over the years had the pleasure of working with a number of UK ministers on diverse topics from counterterrorism and counterproliferation to NATO to our nuclear deterrent uh, to illicit finance. And broadly speaking, our two nations collaborate on these matters in ways that are truly unique and special. Though honestly, when it came to illicit finance during the Trump administration, particularly dirty Russian money in the UK, uh, and shell companies established in the Crown dependencies and so on, uh, sometimes our agreement in principle did not translate into agreement to take action. But that's all changed, and it's changed radically and for the better. I think in large measure due to Brexit, which freed the UK from constraints originating out of Brussels on what the UK could and could not do, such as sanctions, but also due to the leadership of conservatives such as Tom, who have actively used the UK's newly found, newly restored authorities and sovereignty to target the proceeds of corruption, both at home in the UK and abroad, and collaboratively with the United States. And I hope that the minister will perhaps today share more on this topic. I know he feels deeply about the anti-corruption fight. And perhaps we can take, uh, have a discussion on what additional steps need to be taken to both seize and freeze not only oligarchic money, but Russian state funds to furnish that assistance directly to the Ukrainian government uh, as their economy has now been shattered by the Russians. Vladimir Putin may have rightly gambled when he launched his attack on how President Biden and Chancellor Schultz and President Macron would react. But it is clear that he completely underestimated the United Kingdom. Where others have hesitated, where others have conjured up red lines, imaginary red lines over different weapon systems being provided or not, over different sanctions being taken or not, the United Kingdom has consistently led and acted. And for that, we are grateful. It is therefore with enormous pleasure, as I said, that I welcome the minister to deliver his remarks and look forward to Nate Sibley uh, conducting the question and answer session following. Minister, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a very kind welcome. And I'm very grateful for the uh, privilege of speaking to you this morning. It's a huge honor to be invited to Hudson because this group has grown from the days <laughs> we're all being greeted. Uh, for those of you who can't hear, we're being greeted by an electronic voice, which I hope is not sent by Beijing, but instead. <laughs> but look, it's a huge pleasure to be here with you because this institution has led much of the conservative debate on what affects so many of us today on global policy that actually isn't about the globe, but is about us here at home, here in the United States, here in the United Kingdom, for me. And as a son of Kent, I have to say, it's always been a touch ironic that coming here to the United States always feels like coming home. For me, it's, uh, it's a bit more, though, than a spiritual home. It's, it's a home that has really shaped so much of my own thinking. It shaped it because from institutions from organizations not very far from here, orders and decisions have been taken that have seen me deploy on operations. But it's also shaped me very much because my godfather was a priest in this community, is a priest in this community, forgive me, I'm seeing him later, at least I hope I am. And he's been ministering to people here for a long time. Now, of course, I am a minister, but my king is very much of this world, uh, not of the next. And I know that we're all looking forward to his coronation later this year. And we all are, because actually this is another thing that we share. We share a great interest in our royal family, including the export of some elements of it. You're very welcome. 
<laughs> and you'll no doubt be seeing here the same outpouring of enthusiasm for His Majesty's coronation that we'll be seeing in the UK. It'll be a moment of fascination, of interest, of intrigue. And we'll all be trying to work out what on earth is going on beneath the canopy as the crown and the oil go on. But it won't be any more than the passion that we all show for your politics, your literature, and your film. Some of it, we share the same confusion. Britain and America have, after all, always been acutely aware of our shared history. And there are a few greater examples of international unity than the way our countries have stood together. We have, together, defended civilization. We have really been the pillars of that defense in the traumas of the 20th century. Because ours is a bond that is built on very, very deep foundations. At the heart is a very simple idea. The idea that the government is the servant and not the master of its citizens. And while famously enshrined in your constitution, the origins of this principle can be traced back to English common law and a thought predate Magna Carta. They have safeguarded against arbitrary use of executive power in both countries for many hundreds of years. And on that principle is built the very structure and institutions that define our two nations. They are, of course, divided into the rule of law that stands higher than any one individual or the state that in our revolution of the 17th century put the people above the king and made everybody subject to the same law. They are the free market on which all our livelihoods depend. They are the schools and universities in which academic freedom and individual ideas can be championed, tested, and the rigor of debate can expose those that are resilient. And of course, they are the democratic norms and institutions themselves. These are the inheritance that we share and the foundation of our kinship, objects of admiration and envy around the world, and they are worth defending. And as heirs to the values and principles that underpin them, that task falls to us. Now, I've spent my career defending these values and principles alongside members of your Congress and Senate, and now other members in other parliaments, I've had the privilege to fight in Iraq and Afghanistan. They were then, as I was, soldiers, Marines, air crew, and sailors. And together we were part of defending the liberties that others, sadly, sacrificed much more than we did to protect. Now today, the defense of our liberties must go beyond the battlefield. Freedom, once threatened by war, is now threatened by the erosion of the very structures and institutions on which freedom depends. We all know that pride comes before a fall, and today the danger is complacency. I remember seeing the damage done to once comfortable homes in Kabul when I was stationed there in 2005. There was evidence in the suburbs of the comfortable life that people had once enjoyed the parties, the cocktails, the normal enjoyment that many people had. But coups and civil wars that followed turned people into refugees and destroyed that civilized community. Many who could have left were later murdered by groups like the Taliban. Sadly, that's come back to pass. They missed the warnings or couldn't respond in time. And our defenses now, our defences today mean that we are unlikely to face anything as awful as that. But what threats are we ignoring? What signs like them are we missing? Now, Rome didn't fall in a day. It was the gradual erosion of the state, the ebbing away of the norms of the Republic. And that's what we must watch out for. For as the US Army Field Manual, I know read by all of you every morning, <laughs> reminds us it is on us to do one thing every day to improve our defensive position. Now, my family missed the warnings in the past. Until my generation, there were more Tugendhats in the records of Yad Vashem than there were in His Majesty's tax office, proof that we, like many others in this world, paid a terrible price for missing the alerts. Individual liberty, the rule of law, and a state accountable to its citizens this is the shared inheritance that many of us take for granted. And yet, historically at least, Britain and the United States have been the exception, not the rule. Take China. 
where individual liberties have been stripped away by a state accountable to no one, or Russia, where the legal vacuum that communism truly is produced an oligarchy run by gangsters as a party's secure elite enriched themselves at the expense of the people. The mistake that many of us made over the past few decades is to believe that the principles underpinning our societies would sell themselves. We reached out, we were open, and we were supportive, but they weren't buying. Some believed that by welcoming the Russian oligarchs and the super wealthy, we could remake them in our image, that as they came to enjoy the riches of our free, open, and democratic societies, they would seek to emulate them at home, that in learning the manners of our schools and our courts, they would inhale our values and laws. And so successive governments turned a blind eye to Moscow's gold, the proceeds of Kremlin-backed corruption, which poured into the West after the fall of the USSR. And countries like ours became a playground for this new global elite. They came to London to enjoy luxury shopping and our rich cultural heritage. They bought houses and sent the, their children to our schools. We failed to pay att sufficient attention to their integrity and the source of their funds and turned a blind eye to their growing influence. Too many continued to support leaders and institutions at home that sought to undermine the principles and institutions on which our freedoms depend. In short, by welcoming those post-Soviet kleptocrats, we enabled Putin's regime. By taking their money, we allowed them to pillage their own country, knowing that their families and their wealth was safe in ours. Now that is coming home to us. The insecurity caused by Putin's greed and the need to sustain his violent regime has turned it, as so often happens, from a center of crime to an exporter of violence. It is not just the Russian people who are suffering now, but Ukrainians, Georgians, and many, many more. As we all know that if we fail to hold the line in the East, it will come West. In short, we were naive. We prioritized wealth over security. Instead of chasing Benjamins, we should have borrowed from Franklin. Those who would give up essential security to purchase a little prosperity deserve neither security nor prosperity. This is the unhappy position that many have found themselves in. Despite warnings by many, including many in this room, they chose cheap energy, forgetting that pipelines bind both ways and that cheap goods cheapen their resilience. That didn't come without cost. Now, sadly, none of this was unforeseeable. In fact, much of it was not only foreseen but predicted and many of us tried to sound the alarm over Nord Stream, over Huawei, and over Londongrad. I spent five years as chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in London, calling out the egregious abuses of our economy and society by maligning states. Because foreign policy isn't about foreigners. It's about us. It's about how we shape the world toward the arc of liberty and the defense of our interests. Our 2018 report on Britain's links to dirty money was called Moscow's Gold. It clearly set out the threat that Russian corruption posed to the United Kingdom. Now, I'm not just referring to the ways in which this corruption has created potential new sources for leverage for Russia to exploit, or how it was enabled, or how it has enabled our enemies to fund hostile actions against us, but to the pernicious and corrosive effect it has on our democracy and on our society. For too long, the, po the poison has been allowed to flow, and I am committed to stopping it. Prime Minister Sunak has made clear it will not be allowed to continue. I agreed to step down as chair of the committee and take this job because across the Western world, governments are finally recognizing the scale of the threats that we all face, and there is finally an opportunity to do something about it. Since February last year, the United Kingdom's government has sanctioned over 1,200 individuals, including more than 130 oligarchs and their family members linked to the Russian state, freezing more than 18 billion pounds of Russian finance in the United Kingdom. And there's more to come. We set up the Combating Kleptocracy Cell in the fantastic National Crime Agency 
tasked with rooting out corrupt elites and their assets in the United Kingdom. The cell has successfully targeted houses, yachts, planes, and much more around the world, and brought enforcement action against professional enablers, such as unscrupulous accountants and lawyers who sell their nations cheaply for 30 pieces of silver. We introduced two key pieces of legislation to deliver sanctions more effectively. Seize suspected crypto assets, sorry, seize suspect crypto assets more quickly and unmask shadowy beneficial owners who hide behind layers of shell companies. And together with you here in the United States, we are leading the global hunt for Putin's cronies and their ill-gotten assets through the Russian elites, proxies, and oligarchs task force, which has blocked or frozen more than $30 billion worth of sanctioned Russian assets in financial accounts and economic resources. Despite these significant strides, we cannot be complacent. My brilliant and determined officials in the Home Office are drawing up the successes to the economic crime plan and the anti-corruption strategy, which will further detail the UK's response to tackling kleptocracy at home and abroad. And through the new economic crime levy, law enforcement agencies will receive hundreds of millions of pounds of new funding to tackle dirty money. But Russia is not alone in hiding wealth overseas. We all know about the oligarchs, but there are other princelings, red princelings, in our society whose states are undermining our freedoms. Many despotic regimes have used our laws to keep their money from the hands of those it was stolen from, and we must go from freezing to seizing and look hard at what we can do to help them get it back. Corruption and kleptocracy will never be welcome on our shores. London Grad is closed. It is a pleasure to work with the dedicated teams here in the United States and elsewhere who are committed to this just as we are not just because of what it does to others, but what it does to us. Just yesterday, we announced a new round of sanctions against Russian cyber criminals who use ransomware to target hospitals and schools. That's not just an attack on institutions, but an attack on our people. Operations delayed and exams disrupted. Illicit finance enables that ransomware. It opens paths to profit for criminal gangs and allows hostile actors vectors of violence against us all. It uses binary code to undermine family life. Illicit finance is one of the many tools employed by our adversaries to undermine our democracy and society. In the past, the security minister's job has focused more on counterterrorism than state threats, and my predecessors were rightly more focused on al-Baghdadi than on Beijing. That's changed. As systematic competition intensifies, authoritarian regimes around the world are beginning to deploy increasingly aggressive tactics against the British and American people. The threats posed by malign states now take many different forms, including espionage, as we've seen reported in your country only this past week, interference, sabotage, and attempts to undermine the rules-based international system. And the tactics they, can, they use can be acute such as Iran's attempts to kidnap or kill British and UK-based individuals, or chronic, as with China's attempt to play the long game by co-opting and influencing parliamentarians and other public servants. And as we are seeing in the news these days, they are evolving and they are rising. That brings me to foreign influence. The UK and her allies face an increasing range of threats from foreign states who are actively seeking to disrupt our political system and interfere with our democracy, our rights, and our freedoms. Efforts to interfere in our academic freedoms and universities are not new, but we have been taking steps now to protect our institutions. This isn't just about protecting British citizens. It is about protecting all those who live in the United Kingdom, because part of the appeal of coming to the UK or the US to study is the opportunity to enjoy the freedoms many of us come to take for granted. But today, illegal police stations operating our countries are just one example of the transnational repression that we are seeing. We have seen states reaching across borders to intimidate, harass, or harm people 
they perceive to be a threat or have a political interest in silencing. This interference in our internal affairs doesn't just target the expatriate community, it harms us all. Smothering freedom of expression in the United Kingdom and shutting down debate harms our students, punishes our professors, and damages our research and understanding of the world. It's no coincidence that free countries like ours generate more ideas and innovation than those who silence the minds of thinkers, punish the successful, and constrain creatives. Now, I am very pleased that Prime Minister Sunak has spoken out about this and has asked me to look at the actions that we can take, but we cannot take them alone. I've asked for a comprehensive review of the UK's approach to transnational repression to ensure that we fully understand the threat and to maximize our ability to address this unacceptable behavior. I look forward to working with Five Eyes, NATO, European, and other friends to see what we can do together. Now, let's be clear what this is for. We're here to defend democracy, the system of challenge and debate that depends on freedom of thought and expression, not just on polls and politicians. This review will form part of a new Defending Democracy Task Force the Prime Minister asked me to set up. And we are working to protect the UK's democratic processes, institutions and society, and to deliver a secure and resilient UK, free from threats of foreign interference. That means ensuring that we are able to respond to a range of threats including foreign interference in electoral processes, our public offices and universities, disinformation, physical threats, and those in cyberspace. We are joining up our efforts across government and the UK intelligence community and working with our partners in parliament, the devolved administrations, local government, the private sector, and civil society. Our aim is to build resilience across all levels of the system. Our security demands a rethink. From local to general elections, from town halls to the Palace of Westminster, our democratic processes and institutions are an essential part of what it means to live in a free and open society. They must be preserved and safeguarded at all costs. As politicians, Marines, journalists, academics and business people, we can't give our nations eternal life, but we can guard the watch that we are on. And I'm reminded, again, of everyone's favorite bedtime reading, that US Army field manual we all hold so dear. It is the duty of every soldier to do one thing every day to improve our defensive position. Now today, on our watch, we have the tools, the plans, and the friends to defend ourselves and support our allies. I look forward to working with many of you here in the United States and around the world to guard our future and to defend our countries together. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Minister, um, for that incredible speech. Uh, my name is Nate Sibley. Uh, as Marshall said, I run the Kleptocracy Initiative here at Hudson Institute. I'm a research fellow, focusing very much on the issues uh, that you were discussing in the second half of your speech there. Um, I wanted to, to maybe kick... I have a few questions of my own. I know you're keen to answer as many uh, questions as possible from our audience here, uh, but I have a few questions of my own. Um, I'm in my element, as you can tell, with the accent. I'm, I'm a dual US-UK citizen and an illicit finance nerd, so really been looking forward to this one. Um, I want to start with a sort of 30,000 sort of que uh, type question. Um, you know, Marshall alluded to in his, his great introduction uh, that Brexit had kind of unlocked um, the UK's ability to do so many good things in the world. Um, but it also has created, you know, uh, a need for the UK to attract more uh, foreign investment. And so as you're thinking about implementing some of the, the, this new sort of sec national security regime, you're also having to balance um, some measures which maybe deter investment, um, you know. Uh, you know, you, you gave a great overview of how of the, the whole London grad situation, how uh, huge torrents of Russian money flooded into the city, which have now flooded out or been frozen, hopefully. Um, can you give us an insight into, you know, the, the conversations in Whitehall, how that sort of shift happened, um, you know, and how that, they, those conversations are continuing to evolve? You know, the Prime Minister's a fi finance background, you're a national security background. Um, so how, how, how is the UK balancing these two competing priorities? So I think the Prime Minister set out his stall very clearly. Uh, you're right, he's, uh, he's from a finance background. And you're also right that we're trying to grow the economy, as every government should. But it shouldn't be grown at the cost 
of the security of our country in years to come. And it shouldn't be grown at the cost of the opportunity of British people to enjoy the prosperity that a networked world of free countries uh, enables. And that's where the balance is coming, and that's where the debate is. Because the reality is that this debate has focused for a long time on the hopeful optimism that quite rightly shaped many views in the 1980s, 90s, as the war, as the Cold War was won. What we need to do now is to recognize that the challenge that we're facing is not that we're about to lose, but that the erosion of those norms has changed the way in which we need to operationalize the institutions. Mm -hmm. And that means that we need to be thinking about what it means, what free trade means when the other party isn't free. Right. That's great. Um, you talked a lot about, you gave, as I said, a great overview of, you know, the the Russian kleptocracy model, the London Grab model, that's kind of become pretty well known, I think, even to sort of lay people, you know, who don't take a casual interest in illicit finance matters. Um, you know, the oligarchs, you know, the way that their uh, their investments were controlled and directed, and, and the, the corrosive effect that can have. Um, but I was struck in your speech how much you, you addressed the issue of the, the sometimes thorny issue of China, and you said that there are also now sort of red print princelings in our midst as well as Russian oligarchs, or perhaps instead of Russian oligarchs. Um, is the financial threat from China uh, different in nature? You know, you, you talked about the, the secret police stations. We've had balloons flying overhead here recently. Um, what is the, f what is the, what is the what, if you, without giving too much away, I suppose, um, what, what, is the di what is different about the, the financial threat that Ch China poses to national security from Russia? Well, it's volume. We're dealing with a very, very different economy mm -hmm. with a very, very different relationship. You know, the reality is we do have to have a commercial relationship with China. In the 1950s and 60s, we had a, almost no commercial relationship with the Soviet Union. There was a little bit of energy sales, and that was pretty much it. We do need a commercial relationship with China. We need to have a relationship with the Chinese people. The challenge is that we need to have it in a way that enables us both to have the liberties that we mm -hmm. uh, have the right to enjoy. And the challenge that we've seen in recent years is that uh, one side has been treating this as a very hostile approach. We've seen uh, the attempts to uh, interfere in uh, our own systems, whether that's closing down academic debate yeah. in our universities. We've seen uh, the attempts to secure monopoly positions uh, from various different ways in which uh, commercial uh, activities have been taken. Uh, and we've seen the way in which the, the Chinese state has repressed its own debates at home uh, and indeed in neighboring countries where uh, we would otherwise uh, be able to enjoy the kind of robust uh, discussion that uh, Brits and Americans are used to. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a very different relationship, and it's one that we need to be conscious of, and it's certainly one we need to be conscious of as dependency has changed. If you look, for example, uh, at so much of our foreign policy for the last 100 years, it's been about the resources that we depend on. And uh, many people have made arguments about our energy dependence on the Middle East, for example. Mm -hmm. But it's worth noting that at various points we were up to 15, maybe even sometimes higher, dependence on oil from certain countries in the Middle East. We're now some 80% dependent for battery technology in China. Mm -hmm. We're very heavily dependent, 60, 70, 80% dependent for wind turbines or for solar panels yeah. on companies in China. And that form of dependency means that we need to think really hard what resilience means, and we need to think very hard about what it means to uh, invest in our future when we're uh, injecting that level of dependence. I want to give you a chance to talk about some of the measures that you are bringing forward, uh, the, the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. You mentioned you brought, you know, two Economic Crime Bills are really accelerated yep. to an unprecedented uh, degree over the past year. Um, you know, financial transparency, it sounds like a wishy-washy issue, but it's actually critical for national security yep. because uh, you know, just to take one example, you can't do you can't do sanctions enforcement if you don't know where the money is, right? So we need things like uh, beneficial ownership registers so that we know who really owns shell companies. Um, you know, we need uh, you know uh, real estate registers to show uh, which foreign entities own land in our country. These are both things that the UK government has implemented. Uh, I think we'd be the first to admit imperfectly, but uh, also pioneeringly. Um, and that's what I think the, the latest crime bill is designed to update and, and address right. some of the issues with those. 
love you to talk about that. But we, would you also like to see, we don't have those measures in place yet in the US, um, which I, uh, despite my best efforts campaigning over the years, uh, many in this room. Um, is that something you think should be a pretty, pretty much a standard between democracies who are looking to uh, you know, defend their financial integrity? I think it's, I think you're right to say that we've, you know, we haven't had a, a great position to preach from over 30 or 40 years, but we're turning that around. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very pleased that this government uh, is demonstrating the commitment to the, ownership, uh, to the uh, beneficial ownership transparency that you speak about, because it's absolutely right. You can't, you can't truly understand the influence on your country and on your decisions if you don't understand where the power lies. And, and economic power is a very significant element of democratic power. We know that. And so finding out who owns what and where is absolutely essential. Now, you know, I'm not the first person to have thought this. Uh, William the Conqueror, when he wrote the <laughs> Doomsday Book, was trying to do exactly the same thing a 1,000 years ago. Um, I've uh, never his, thought of that. Well, it's the first record of beneficial <laughs> ownership. There you go. It was written by William the Conqueror. Um, and uh, you know, there's many others who have updated it since um, in different ways. And so finding ways in which we can do so today is absolutely essential. Because the reality is that the, the challenge that we face is not British. You know, if, we are, if we're chasing dirty assets and we leave a UK jurisdiction and arrive in somebody else's, mm -hmm. we need the cooperation yep. that enables us to follow it. And if they don't have the ability, then they don't have the, uh, they don't have the ability to help us. Yep. And that, is, that can be difficult. No, it's an interesting. It's something I have in conversations with the US uh, law enforcement agencies all the time. They, they use the UK uh, registers you know, every day, like UK law enforcement does. It's, it's um, you know, an evident, as a matter of evidence, it's helpful to law enforcement when they're doing sanctions evasion, but also you know, illegal drugs <laughs> you know, enforcement, right. all sorts of in financial, any I mean, the, the, the reality crime. is here, what we're talking about, I mean, we're talking about economic crime, mm -hmm. as though it's a subset or as though it's a standalone issue. It's not. Economic crime is part of state threats, it's part of terrorism, it's part of narcotics, it's part of yep. the general threat that all of us face. And until we treat it like that, as we are trying to in the United Kingdom, and until we all treat it like that, we're leaving ourselves exposed uh, with vectors of attack that we haven't closed off. One of the things you mentioned, just following on from that, it's just about the issue of a sort of implementation and enforcement. There's a perception um, it's a generalization, um, so don't get, get offended, but there's a perception sort of when, when I've talked with, with, with counterparts in the UK who work on these issues, Transparency International and so on, uh, that the US is very, very good at putting money, at resources into enforcement. It's very aggressive about enforcement. If it, if it passes a law and says it's going to do something, it does it, and you're, you know, if you're a bad guy, you are going to get your door kicked in at some point by the FBI at three in the morning. Um, on the flip side, the UK is a real leader when it comes to anti-corruption innovation, with these registers and so on and so forth. But it doesn't put the necessary sort of resources. Uh, that it has the right rhetoric, it has the right political will and intention, but the, the resources just aren't there for law enforcement to go after the bad guys uh, using these tools. Um, are you planning in the new um, the new legislation to to beef up uh, resources for for you know like the National Crime Agency and those, those those groups that are tasked with doing that? So I'd say that's historically perhaps fair, but the reality is if you look at the National Crime Agency today and look at organizations within it, like the counter-kleptocracy cell, which I think is a fantastic example of what the UK can do when it puts its mind to it. It, it. You're seeing an enforcement ability that very few can replicate. Now, I know the United States has, has replicated parts of that as well, yeah. but very few others have. And it's an extremely impressive capability that is beginning to close down many of those vectors that you spoke about. Now, what we need to do, and you're absolutely right, is we need to find better ways of uh, making sure that when our agencies take legal action against people, they, that doesn't result in their budgets being entirely consumed for a year and that we yeah. end up uh, being able to support the kinds of actions that US officials in various different ways are able to do at state and federal level. Now, there is work to do, and there's work to do for both of us in learning off each other, and that's why I'm here in the United States, because the reality is we share a complete commitment to the same ends. Mm -hmm. We share many, many of the same principles that go in at the fundament. What we need to do is make sure that we're learning off each other yeah. uh, in terms of operationalizing the issues that, we, that challenge us. No, and to be fair, the US and the UK do have the closest relationship, and there has been the most energy that I've seen between two countries in, in, arranging, in arranging that. Um, just finally for me, my ears pricked when you said that you've frozen, what, 18 billion pounds? Was pounds, what, was, yeah. was it? Yep. 
um, you know, but the, the, the repo countries as a whole, which is sort of the G7 plus, I think Japan and Australia, was it? I can't remember. Um, a frozen sort of collectively around $30 billion. So the UK holds doing a, lot. a huge chunk of the money that's been frozen. Um, are there plans uh, to, uh, to seize that money? Uh, do you have the legal uh, mechanism to do so? And if you do so, are there plans to transfer that money uh, to Ukraine? So there are, there are challenges there. And um, you know, I think we've got to face them. I mean, the reality is that um, Magna Carta that I spoke of guaranteed, <laughs> admittedly, the property rights of barons. But yeah. I suppose oligarchs <laughs> are the modern barons, aren't they? Um, the, it guaranteed property rights. Um, and various of our elements of our common law have always been uh, clear that um, seizure has to be in very, very constrained circumstances. What I'd like to do, uh, and this is a conversation that we are having with common law jurisdictions, is to find ways in which we can approach this. Now, I'm yeah. not going to pretend I've got an answer now. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, but we are looking for answers, and we're looking for ways in which to do this. But we are seeing um, that pressure can make a difference as well. Uh, many of you will know that um, uh, one sanctioned individual looks like he's going to surrender the sanctioned money, mm -hmm. the frozen money. Uh, in order to enable the reconstruction work in Ukraine and around the world yeah. that has been caused by uh, the brutality of Russian aggression against uh, the Ukrainian people. So there are, the, you know, it's not just legal, there is also social pressure that can be put. Well, it goes to what sanctions are, are for, which is always an interesting question, because I think most people just think, oh, sanctions, that's what we do when bad guys do something instead of shooting them, right, or something like that. Um, <laughs> you know, the, maybe that's the sort of, it's the, it's the thing that, Policymakers reach for instead of you know you know more confrontational measures, um, but you know what, what do you how do you see this sort of playing out the, the if we call it the oligarch sanctions regime as opposed to the sort of central bank sanctions regime? What is the you, you talked about this one oligarch? He's I think he's offered to surrender his wealth um, you know presumably to get off the sanctions list. Um, do you think these, the rest of these oligarchs are just going to stay on the sanctions list the rest of their lives? Are there like off ramps for them? Should there be off ramps for them? How do you think about that? So I. There's a, there's a lot of conversation about this, and um, whichever answer you choose raises challenges. Mm -hmm. But I think it is important that what we, you know, to focus on what we're trying to do. Yeah. What we're trying to do is we're trying to recognise that much of this money is stolen off the Russian people, first of all, uh, in various different ways, and it's sanctioned because of the ways in which uh, these individuals are now sustaining uh, one of the most murderous and barbaric regimes the world has seen in. 70, 80 years. Um, and so finding ways to address that is important. But what's also important is finding ways to encourage them to choose, to make better choices, right. as um, the teachers would put it. <laughs> um, and you know, helping people to, to see that there is an alternative. Yeah. And so an off-ramp um, would have to be carefully calibrated. But yeah. if, if we can find an off-ramp, that would be a useful achievement. Mm -hmm. OK, well, I've been um, hogging you. Uh, so I'm going to open it up for questions. We have a little bit of time here. Um, I think you were first, uh, so I'm right. And uh, if you could just state your name and affiliation and uh, keep questions reasonably sort of succinct uh, just for the rest of the audience. Uh, yeah, my first, um, I, I'm Peter Sommer. I'm a capital intelligence. I have a CI Ukraine service. And my question is um, uh, to um, Minister, it looks like there's an emergency meeting at the White House over Ukraine, the Joint Chief of Staff, and one of the questions, you've been very much in Ukraine. And my other question is, have you talked to our Attorney General Merrick Garland about using the long arm of the U.S. law regarding the oligarchs? Um, uh, one of the things is, you know, you have BVI, British Virgin Islands, a lot of the oligarch companies are, you know, incorporated there, you know, in, in your territory. So will you be working with the U.S. Justice Department to make sure that these oligarchs, you know, do f get prosecuted in the U.S.? I mean, we have a better record of taking these people like Fairtash and stuff and putting them into U.S. jails. Thank you. So first of all, on meetings in the White House, I'm not regularly <laughs> invited to them. Um, <laughs> not, not since we burnt it down 200 years ago. Um, the, the, the cooperation on different forms of prosecution are, um, is, is one of the reasons I'm here. And I've been meeting with people in the Department of Justice, uh, including in the FBI, to talk about how we share intelligence, how we share information to make sure that we're enabling each other. Because as Nate mentioned, <clears throat> as you mentioned, we do have different talents, right? And we are doing different things uh, 
to different levels of success. And so areas where you're able to uh, advance uh, an end state is uh, certainly very welcome. And BVI? Oh, sorry. Well, on the BVIs and um, BVI and USVI, yes. I mean, that's, uh, those areas of cooperation are absolutely essential. Um, I think uh, we, you were next, I think, and then I'll come to you, Chris. <laughs> Jonathan Rush, American University, Washington College of Law. Since 2021, President Biden and the Biden administration have explicitly adopted the concept of corruption as a national security priority and infused that into a national strategy for combating corruption. Now, that's our conceptualization, but to what extent do you think UK government policy is similarly influenced with that kind of conceptualization? And others, to what extent do you think that, apart from our general common goal in combating corruption, do you think that that idea of linkage between corruption and national security priority infuses the thinking about uh, how UK government should respond? So I think it's very, very similar. The reality is that when you remove the rule of law, you remove the ability of people to predict the future and to be secure in their future by any other way other than the use of violence and corruption. And so fighting corruption is a way of making sure that you do not see the path continue to the inevitable, which is the export of violence. Whatever state you're in, the erosion of the rule of law will always lead to the rise in violence. And sadly, that's what we're seeing in the most egregious sense in Russia today, uh, but it's true around the world, and that's why fighting corruption is so important. Chris, I think you're next, and then I'll come to you. So, Mr. Minister, thank you for your clear-minded remarks. Chris Walker at the National Endowment for Democracy. So you've described the steps um, that the UK with the US in some instances are taking to kind of turn, turn the tide and get, get out front of these issues that have been um, growing over a period of time. I wonder if you could say a word about other parts of the world that don't have the institutions and resources to deal with the sweeping engagement from China and Russia alike Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, we could even include parts of the Western Balkans in this conversation, in terms of the kleptocracy, information, technological penetration, and what we should be thinking about in these systems that are going to need a lot of help to compete and get themselves to defend their own integrity. So this is where <clears throat> I think the actions that we take are so important. Because the reality is, markets like ours, whether you're in the US or the UK, are the kind of places where people come to put their wealth for an insurance policy against the future. You know, if you're in a jurisdiction that may be vulnerable, that may be used to political turmoil, you may well invest in US or UK assets in order to secure a future for your family, for your children, that you couldn't expect if you merely own property or, or, or assets at home. And so what we do, how we do beneficial ownerships and the way in which we fight corruption is fundamental to helping these people resist against the pressures of corrupting regimes that come and seek to influence them. Because if you can't hide your money in London or New York, you're significantly less likely to steal it and try to hide it in the countries you hinted at. And therefore, if we want to secure democracy around the world, which certainly we do not by force, but by uh, encouragement, then helping people to have a state in which corruption isn't part of life it would be extremely helpful. Uh, Alex, so you're in the middle there. Too. Thanks. Minister, thank you very much for your speech and your continued leadership from the Foreign Affairs Committee through to today. Uh, my name is Alex Jacobs from the Joffe Trust from the UK. We work particularly on illicit finance. <coughs> I wondered if you could say something about the competing principles of privacy and transparency around the beneficial ownership registers. I'm sure you're very familiar with the challenge in the European courts on this. And whether you could reconfirm that the UK government would expect our Crown dependencies and overseas territories to implement public beneficial ownership registers by the end of this year and the UK government will, maintain, will continue to be committed to public access? So first of all, the UK government's position on that hasn't changed. And secondly, there is a difference between secrecy and privacy. 
we have the right to a private life. Everybody has the right to a private life. That is not the same as the right to a secret life. And what we're challenging here through beneficial ownerships and transparency is that attack on secrecy, the, the, the ability to behave in ways that fundamentally undermine uh, the rule of law and the accountability that citizens should have to each other. And we could be talking about the UK and the US, but we could be talking about any other country too. The reality is that if you don't have that level of accountability, if it's undermined by secrecy, not privacy, then you're in a very different world. This is a big argument we had here when we had the Corporate Transparency Act passed last yeah. year. Um, there's a huge sort of lobby. I think it was mainly the small business lobby. That was, that was their main argument, you know, was that this was a, not only going to be a business burden, which the UK demonstrably proved. Did not Sorry, it's, it's not a burden. <laughs> it, it, you know, transparency is not a burden. Mm -hmm. It is a recognition of the reality of the nature of power in a modern democracy. Yeah. If you want to have accountable government, if you want to have uh, a fair tax system, if you want to have uh, an awareness of, of, of where pressure on your economy, on your democracy comes from, you need to know. Sure. And it also, I, I sat with my brother-in-law as he set up his UK company a couple of Christmases ago. And it literally took him 30 seconds to fill out the, the beneficial ownership <laughs> declaration page and he was on to the next bit. So, um, you know, it's not a burden. And as you say, there's a difference between privacy and secrecy. Um, do we have any more questions? Uh, oh, I've lost questions. Uh, I'm going to get fired if I don't come to John Walters, my boss, in the front row there. Well, well first, I want to thank uh, uh, Minister for being here. Thanks for the hard work and uh, your long service and, uh, and, and risk of your own life in, uh, in service of the goals of our two countries. Um, um, I wondered, Hudson was originally founded to think more strategically about things. And, and, and you're talking about some of the laws and concepts here. But I wonder if you think we have done an adequate job of thinking of this in, in strategic terms. Uh, if the rise of transnational crime, of oligarchic rule as an alternative, if the, if the use of these forces to undermine democratic and popular governments is, 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 is deserving of much more profound uh, evidence rather than just saying, well, there's some bad guys over there, we want to take away their money, or there's corruption of some of our... I think the difference somewhat times talked about between a law enforcement problem and a national security problem. But I wonder if, if you think we have the right strategic conceptions of, of, the, of, the, of the overall threat and the parts of it, uh, or whether that needs more uh, clarity in the, in the work that we need to do ahead. So John, I think that's a very good question. And it's, it's interesting, it's, my job as security minister is, includes some elements of law enforcement and large elements of national security. And if I'm honest, it's very hard to put the line on an appropriate place on that, because is the, you know, is the uh, use of cash to buy crypto in a drugs world to get that crypto out of the country that is then used to buy weapons that is then used to enable terror groups is that is that crime or is that national security? Well, it's both. Of course, it's both. Uh, and the same is true on so many other areas where you see this interlocking element. If you look at ransomware, for example, the, the, the individuals that we sanctioned yesterday, is an attack on 235 hospitals in the United States. Is that crime because you're trying to get the ransom, you're trying to get the payment? Or is it a test for a national security threat that will bring down the US medical system? I mean, it's both, right? I mean, and the reality is that the the overlap between crime and national security is, is very great. And that's why, coming to your extremely well-made point, you know, if you look at the strategy of this, if you look at the fundamentals of this, <coughs> the basic attempt of all humans for thousands of years has been to predict the future. Right? And we've done it in various different ways, casting knuckle bones on the ground or looking at the weather app on Apple and hoping it's correct. Um, but fundamentally, the only way in which you predict the future in human society is you create rules and you stick to them. We call it the rule of law. You can call it whatever you like. But that ability to create rules and stick to them is the basic human algorithm. If you don't do that, the only alternative of the basic human algorithm of the rule of law is the rule of force. And the rule of force can only come about if you erode the rule of law 
can only come about if you do not stand up and defend the elements that make you able to stand together as a community. So the rule of law allows you to stand together as a much greater community. The rule of force reduces you inherently to smaller groups, fighting bands, if you like. And so fighting corruption is a way of making sure that that arrow that is never absolute in either direction arcs towards law and away from force and violence. Oh, Gary Kalman uh, at the back there. Hi, thank you, Minister. Um, my name is Gary Kalman. I'm with Transparency International US. Um, my question is, uh, one of the things that we've seen, just a little bit more of a, I suppose, practical question here, um, is the development of repo and the individual task forces in the country have moved information sharing much more rapidly than we've seen in the past. It used to take months or years to share information, and now we're seeing information moving between borders much more quickly. This is, for some of us, very exciting in terms of are there lessons from repo um, that we could take and move forward and potentially expand, I mean, not necessarily repo itself, but come out of this with a much more expanded, more nations involved, um, and, uh, and use those lessons to move information more quickly, not just for this crisis, but into the future. So, I, Look, I think the work that Transparency International does is incredibly important, because what you're quite rightly doing is pointing a finger at those of us who could do better. Uh, and I think that's hugely important. And I think you're, you're also right that the lessons that we draw, and I hope I tried to make this point, clearly didn't make it quite well enough, but the lessons that we draw on the olig from the oligarchs, we need to be applying in other areas. Because this isn't just about Russian oligarchs. It's not just about the Kremlin. Yes, it's one of the most egregious examples. Yes, Putin is one of the wealthiest men in the world. Yes, he's surrounded himself by a bunch of thieves who depend on him entirely for their continued existence. But he's not alone. There are others, you know. There are other princes, there are other emperors who go around with their similar criminal enterprises, other mafia economies that are similarly threatening. And we need to make sure that we're learning off one to apply it to others. I think the UK and the US have a special data sharing agreement which came into effect a few weeks uh, ago. A few weeks ago yeah, okay. well, yeah. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, I can tell you it started recently. It's already providing uh, extremely useful uh, cooperative uh, information. Uh, and I mean, it's early days, but I look forward to seeing how it grows. And I look forward to seeing how we can uh, tune it so that it better serves the needs of both sides. Yeah. OK. Oh, Abby. Hi, thank you, uh, Minister. I'm Abby Fu, a research fellow here at Hudson, focusing on international economics and China. Um, my question is, um, as we've seen with the incident at the Manchester uh, consulate, um, as you mentioned in your speech, you know, we should be focused not just about uh, American or British citizens, but also people that reside uh, in the US and UK that could potentially you know, um, be threatened uh, mm -hmm. by the Chinese in terms of uh, certain political uh, action or uh, freedom of speech. And I was wondering if you had any comments on that specifically. Sure. Thank you. Look, I mean, I think you make a very good point. And three or four years ago, I wrote a piece for Atlantic. Am I allowed to mention them here? It's probably, <laughs> it's probably a bit left wing for you. The, um, I wrote a piece in Atlantic about British nationals overseas and the duty that we as the UK owed those British nationals overseas, Hong Kong, Hong Kongers, who were seeing their rights eroded. And I made the argument, which I stand by, which is that British nationals, wherever they are in the world, have the same right of protection of the British state. And if that right is being eroded, then they, have the, then they should have the right to come to the UK due to various decisions made in the 1980s that those rights have been changed. And I'm very glad um, that uh, Priti Patel, the then Home Secretary, uh, made the reforms necessary to allow Hong Kongers uh, with connections to the UK to come home. And I'm extremely pleased that many have chosen to do so. We've got uh, uh, a large and growing Hong Konger population in the United Kingdom of people who quite rightly uh, feel that they have the, the right to be in the United Kingdom. They feel it because it's true. They do. Um, 
And this is where I think we've got to be really clear-eyed when we're talking about some of these threats. Because it's unlikely that I'm going to be facing significant personal threats from the Ministry of State Security or its envoys in the UK or through the consulate system of the Chinese state. But it is very likely that they are. And so when we talk about defending ourselves against the CCP or against other transnational threats, we've got to recognize that what we're doing is we're protecting those who are most likely to be in danger. And that is very often the population with the strongest connection to the threatening state. In this case, Chinese nationals uh, who may be studying in our university, Hong Kongers who may be resident in the United Kingdom. Uh, and so you know, I, I think we need to be very clear that those who, you know, those who would use this in order to try to separate us or for, you know, to try and make absurd racial arguments, it, it's ridiculous. It's not that. It's about defending those in the UK or in, uh, in the United States and making sure that people are protected and able to live their lives freely. Time for just one more. I'll go to the back corner. Oh, um, lady in the beige coat. Sorry, I can't. I don't have my glasses on. If I know you, apologies. Uh, I, can't, I can't. Your face is all fuzzy. So. Hi, I'm uh, Fatima Hussein with the Associated Press. Oh, I do know you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've talked before. We've talked before. Um, yeah, so I, I have a very general audience, the average American reader. Um, you know, I've been following and we've all been following the sanctions. Uh, forgive me, my hearing is absolutely appalling. My, m can you hear? Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, we have a very general audience at the Associated Press, and in talking to the average American, they, many other people and experts, have said, "Why are the impacts of the sanctions taking so long? Um, at what point will we see Russia essentially crumble and this war end?" Can you explain to the average person, um, which I intend to write a story about? you know, the impact of sanctions, especially a year after they've been implemented, um, why are they taking so long to, to have a, a major impact, seeing how Russia's economy is actually going to do better, according to the IMF, than, than the UK? So, first of all, the, the sanctions aren't taking long. Let me explain why I would argue that. Because the sanctions are there to stop the finances that have been stolen off the Russian people being used to leverage harm against us or against the Ukrainians to finance more of this war. And what the sanctions have done is they've frozen literally billions of dollars of assets and constrained the actions of the Russian state by doing so. Because a lot of these oligarchs, you may think that it was their money. It wasn't their money. It was held under license. And if Putin asked for it to spend on an assassination or to spend on an Olympic Games, he could simply ask for it and demand that it was paid. Now, what we've managed to do is close down quite a lot of his ability to act abroad by closing down his financial levers. What you're asking about is why hasn't it collapsed the Russian state? Because that's not what it's designed to do. The reality is Russia is a very, very large country. It has energy and food resources that are very great. And we're not trying to collapse the Russian state. What we're trying to do is to stop the Russian state threatening its neighbors. And that's what these sanctions are doing. So we've got to look at what the intent is, not just what some people may wish to happen. And that's why I think we need to focus on looking at it. Frankly, it is succeeding. It is making a huge difference. And what's quite remarkable if I may, is the way in which many other countries have reformed themselves in the last 12 months away from dependency on Russia. If you were to ask many of us, I think, in this room uh, only a year ago what effect uh, the closure of energy connections between uh, Russia and other Eastern European countries would have had, we'd have predicted to varying degrees economic hardship and dependency would have predicted the fracturing of the Western alliance. But none of that has happened. And it hasn't happened because actually countries have adapted extremely well and overcome some rather appalling decisions over the last decade or more into some better ones in recent years. So I'm looking forward very much to a growing awareness of that energy security 
uh, and economic security are connected. Uh, and if you want independence, you need both. Just to sort of wrap up, um, and following on from, from Flatman's question, um, but reflecting on a week of meetings with your counterparts in Washington, um, are we moving, uh, is that process happening fast enough? Um, you know, it took a, took the, a, a new land war in Europe uh, for us to get serious about democratic resilience in our own societies. Um, is that political momentum, momentum going to carry on, are we gonna, or are we going to need another big shock to the system to do the next round and keep us safer? Is it going to take the invasion of Taiwan or something, you know, just to be blunt? So, I, first of all, I, I hope that doesn't happen. But the, um, look, I've spent five years calling this out, so do, if you ask me, has it happened fast <laughs> enough? No, of course it hasn't happened fast <laughs> enough. Um, but the reality is um, that for any of us who've worked in government, the frustration of inertia is, is just the nature of a democratic system that has checks and balances and accountability. Uh, you may not like it, but trust me, it's better than the alternative. Um, and the, the reality is that um, the direction, I think, is now very clearly set. Look, it's, it's very hard now to meet a large commercial entity that doesn't talk about resilience, that doesn't say, hang on a minute, if I'm buying, you know, if I'm planning to go green, where am I getting the batteries from? Am I buying batteries that are made from products mined by children in Africa, turned into products by slaves in China? And am I embedding a dependency into my economic future that will fail every ESG test mm -hmm. today, let alone tomorrow? You know, you won't, you won't find companies making those decisions in the same way today. People are in a, in a very different place. And I don't see that going backwards. Because the reality is, you know, the reality is, is clear. Mm -hmm. that we know now very clearly what's happening in many countries around the world. We know, because I'm afraid Russia has proved it, mm -hmm. what the risks are, not just to their neighbors, but also to the rest of us. You just need to talk to Lebanese or Egyptian uh, families to know what the impact of the war in Ukraine was. Mm -hmm. You just need to talk to people in Algeria or Morocco to know what the war in Ukraine did to their food prices to their ability to feed their families. You know, it's been destructive. It's been hugely destructive. Putin's reach has harmed literally millions of people around the world, tens of millions of people around the world. And we know, therefore, that you know, that level of dependency, that level of interaction has, has changed. And so I think there's a growing awareness that resilience is something we all need to think about differently. We need to talk about how we work with friends and allies and are dependent on people we can trust. Uh, and not find ourselves exposed, as sadly, through various hopeful reasons, many people did in recent decades. Well, on that hopeful note, um, thank you for your time today, Minister. We've run over a bit. Um, sorry about that. But um, this was all great stuff, and I, I was delighted uh, by pretty much everything you said. So, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for your continued leadership. Uh, Stretching back to Parliament, and I hope it's long may it continue. Long may we have you back at Hudson Institute in the near future. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> nice to see you.